Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. The Octagon Theatre in Bolton has just announced its season for autumn 2019, the first under new artistic director Lottie Wakeham, who took up the post in February after working as Associate Artistic Director of the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough. The theatre building is currently in the middle of a major refurbishment project, and so the productions in the season will take place in other locations around Bolton. I managed to speak to Lottie in her office the day after the new season announcement, with the sound of the theatre rebuilding work next door in the background. First of all, you've been in the job three months. Yes. So you're in the job long enough to be settled in and, and know what you can do, but still with the enthusiasm to want to want to do new things. So how's it been the first three months? It's, you, has it been busy? It's been very busy. <laughs> it's been brilliant. Uh, so I, I moved to Bolton in February. Um, before that, I was living over in Scarborough. And it's been great just to get to know the town, get to know the audiences. And just my colleagues have been absolutely wonderful, really supportive, really enthusiastic. And it's a really interesting time for the organisation because... We don't have our theatre building at the moment because we're doing this big capital refurbishment project, this £12 million project, and the theatre will reopen in April 2020. So all of this year we're out and about producing work in other spaces around Bolton, and that you know is a challenge for the organisation, but also really exciting as well because it means we can take our work to different spaces. So we've got production coming up at the Albert Halls, and we're going to be we've just announced that we're going to do some plays at the library, and then we'll be back at the football stadium at Christmas. So it's great to be able to go out and take our work to different places, but it is, you know, it's not the same as having your own space. So everyone's very excited about moving back in, but also, yeah, the opportunities of just being on the road, out and about. <laughs> yeah, so you've been an uh, associate director, of, you said, at Scarborough, mm-hmm. yeah. but uh, this is your first building-based it is, uh, yeah. artistic directorship. Yeah. First time running a building and you don't actually have a building. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that, it's such... It's such an exciting time to be joining because when the building does open... It'll be yours. Yeah, it's like <laughs> having this, um, yeah, just this amazing opportunity to put my stamp on the building and how I, my vision for the organisation. So, yeah, that it feels like a very exciting time to come with all of that new energy. So how much say have you got? Because it was already well on the way by the time you arrived. Mm-hmm. So how much say? Are you, I know, obviously, you're in charge of the repertoire and... Mm-hmm. But I mean, are you choosing curtains and things like that? I mean, that? yeah, there's a lot of discussion about interior design. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, with my the rest of my colleagues in the senior management team, we have a lot of meetings with our architects and designers about yeah. how we want the feel of the interior to be, right down to, yeah, colour choices and fabrics and, you know, what colour should we paint the walls of the auditorium, that sort of thing. So almost more visual, I guess, involvement than... I had thought I wasn't quite sure what stage they would be at when yeah. I joined, but there's still a lot that's that's up for grabs. So yeah, it's great to have quite a lot of input into that. But the, the theatre space itself is basically going to be the same, isn't it? It's a quite yes. a famous space, yeah. a very adaptable space. How well do you know the theatre space, not being from the area? So I'd seen a couple of shows here and I'd heard a lot about it because, as you say, it is such a world-renowned space, really. Um, You know, it's been there 50 years and it was the first fully flexible auditorium in the country. So that means that you can... The seating can be reconfigured to create a totally different space. So sometimes you might go and see a production and it will be in the round and the next production might be end-on and uh, the next production might be thrust. So... There was that real flexibility to it, which is such a gift as a director because mm. there are some plays that you think might be really well suited to being in the round, for example. So it's amazing to have that flexibility. That auditorium will be the same, although with new improved seating. So it will still have that flexibility, but it will mean that the we've got these new sort of high spec <laughs> seating banks that are very much easier to reconfigure basically I, right. from what I gather it was quite a labour intensive thing to change them from end on to in the round and now it's going to be much easier the but technology's yeah. improved yeah the technology's improved in the last uh, few decades which is great but yeah everything else so audiences who are familiar with the octagon will walk into that auditorium and be at home there and know it but everything else around the auditorium is changing so the front of house bar cafe rehearsal space offices and studio theatre as well yeah. So yeah, we're keeping the like heart of the building, and then everything else is going to be 21st century, like up to scratch. Yeah, 
it's always a challenge for front of house in a theatre like this. It always amuses me. They have to when you walk in, they have to consult their plans to say, "Well, where is seat A one this week?" You know, because it, it changes all the time. And so, yeah. but they're fantastic. The front of house. Yeah, team. we've got an amazing front of house team, and it's been brilliant to start getting to know them. But and a lot of them have been with the organisation for a really long time, yeah, yeah. and they're so knowledgeable about the work that's been produced here and they really know we've got a very loyal audience as well so they have that relationship with the audience and yeah they know that auditorium inside out so I think they're all excited to get back in there in a year's time as well yeah and the, you know, like you say it's uh, it's one of those theatres that does it's very much rooted in Bolton mm-hmm. it doesn't just happen to be here yeah and it does have a loyal audience so uh, do you have any plans to in- involve the uh, the local community at all? Yeah, I mean, th- so the theatre, as you say, it's always been at the heart of the community. And when I was applying for the job, I really found that fascinating, doing research into that. And the fact that the theatre came about because these five students and their tutor had this idea to build it and yeah. to go, Bolton deserves a world-class theatre in the centre of it. We're going to build it. And then they got the town involved. And literally the people of this town built that theatre kind of brick by brick. They sponsored yeah, yeah. it. So, yeah, it's always been in the heart of the community. And that's really important to me. And it's been brilliant just getting to know people from different community groups and councillors or partners at the library or partners at the university. And just that will definitely continue. Like, we're creating theatre it's made in Bolton and it's for the people of Bolton. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're following the footsteps of Elizabeth Newman, mm-hmm. who certainly wasn't shy about putting herself about around, around town. <laughs> yeah. So um, has that made it easier for you? Or is that just a, a difficult act to follow, do you think? No, I mean, it's a great a great legacy to have you know Elizabeth and artistic directors prior to Elizabeth who were so um, beloved by the community and had all those great contacts in a way I think that's much easier in a way because she had such a good relationship with so many local stakeholders so it's great to be able to carry on that mantle absolutely so what's your route been here I believe you, you first directed at school didn't you yeah I did I was lucky I went to a, um, a state school uh, down in Kent but um, there were sort of opportunities to get involved in drama from from school age which was great and not everyone has the opportunity to do that but I was lucky to be able to and then was able to do bits of work experience and stuff and then when I was at university I was able to do some directing while I was there and just really fell in love with it and thought this is what I want to do I want to tell stories and uh, I want to be the person who gets to you know tell other people what to do as well because I'd done a bit of acting when I was younger and I didn't know that I was about 15 or 16 before I realized that being a director was a role that you can have and uh, yeah I was just lucky to get you know little bits of experience immediately after uni you know directing shows like in tiny rooms above pubs that sort of thing but also doing that kind of in tandem with being an assistant director so getting to learn from really experienced directors. So I, I came up that route, really, doing a mixture of these very sort of small shows that I was directing and then gradually you sort of get opportunities to direct in bigger and bigger spaces and, you know, bigger kind of London fringe venues and then starting to direct a bit regionally as well. So, yeah, it's been, yeah, sort of about 10 years of being freelance and doing that in tandem with doing some really valuable assisting and associate work. So I was the associate, well, I still am the associate director on Matilda for the RSC and got to do that show in Stratford and then took that to the West End and then took that to Broadway. And that was an amazing experience just to see that, you know, piece of new writing through from kind of early workshop stages right through to, you know, where it is now, you know, in the West End and going out on these UK tours and stuff. So it's been, I was sort of able to do that in tandem with doing my own bigger productions and then a couple of years ago I got I was asked to direct a show at Scarborough at the Stephen Joseph Theatre as a freelancer and totally fell in love with it and just loved making a piece of work in that town and then I was invited back to do another freelance show there and at that point I thought oh I'd really love to just spend time like a proper amount of time in a regional building and see what that's like because as a as a director, you sort of can either go down one of two paths. You either, you either are freelance, which means you you know travel all over the place and pop up in different places making work, or you are building based. So you're yeah. in one building for a longer period of time and just making work for that organisation. And because I'd never experienced that before, I didn't know how I'd find it. But I applied for some funding to spend a year on attachment at the Stephen Joseph Theatre as associate artistic director. So learning what that role is, because actually being an artistic director 
is very different to being a freelance director. Yeah. I mean, there's the overlap of you have to direct shows, which is great, but there's also so much other other responsibilities that come with that role. So part of it is about programming, you know, programming a season of work. Um, part of it is getting involved in management of the organisation, spending time with the board and other stakeholders. And basically there's lots of things that you have to do outside the rehearsal room which are really hard to learn yeah. if you haven't spent time, you know, attached to a building. So the year that I spent in Scarborough was just life-changing, really, being in that theatre for a year, really getting to know that community. And really, I was, you know, working closely with the artistic director, Paul Robinson, and learning, sort of learning on the job what that role was. And I was really prepared, you know, having had a really fun freelance career and travelling around and going to New York and stuff, I was really prepared to get a few months into it and think actually being building based isn't for me I, I miss would miss being freelance but the more time I spent there the more I thought actually I love this I love just being in one town getting to know this audience and making work like really bespokely for them and I didn't miss being freelance at all really because I was still directing shows but also yeah I just loved being involved in the full life of that building so that as I was you know in that job I thought oh I I really feel that I would like to be an artistic director of, an, of a, a, a building and so was was starting to like look into opportunities to do that and it's been, you know, I'm sure you know, a sort of bumper 18 months or two yeah. years yeah. of lots of artistic directors of regional buildings either moving on to other ones or going freelance so there's been lots of kind of change and lots of opportunities coming up. So when the Octagon job came up, I thought, oh, I just would love to apply for it. I'd seen stuff at the Octagon and knew of its amazing reputation. So I applied and was so thrilled to get the job. Just, yeah, over the moon to get it. And, yeah, it's been brilliant. <laughs> so the the control that you're talking about that you liked as a director, mm. as an artistic director, that's that's bigger and longer term, isn't it? You, because even as a director, freelance director, you don't have much control over what you direct you, to a large extent you're still just just like an actor you're just you're still applying for jobs yeah aren't you? it's a really interesting mi- mixture being a freelance director because some of the time you are you might have the idea to direct a production say you really wanted to direct a production of hamlet and yeah. you had a really strong vision of i really want to set it in this kind of place and have this kind of actor play hamlet you can then sort of travel around different regional theatres and pitch that idea to them. Yeah. So part of that, part of the role is pitching your ideas to venues and saying, I think it would be great if I directed Hamlet for you for these reasons. So that's sort of half your time pitching your own like passion projects. And then the other half of the time is people coming to you and saying, I've got this script and I think you'd be great to direct it. Would you like to? So, yeah, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a mix of sort of, projects that you're really passionate about but also weighing up oh how would I feel about going and directing this you know new play in in this venue that I've been asked to do but yeah the having more scope for control that that is an amazing thing because as a freelancer you are very you're sort of at the mercy of other people saying yes to you yeah and you know what's incredible now that I'm the artistic director here at the octagon is having that ability to say I think it would be great to do this show and then being able to do it. <laughs> and yeah, also, yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm most enjoying is, you know, over the years, I've built up contacts with lots of brilliant writers and directors and designers and actors. And being able to call up colleagues and say, please, will you come and direct a show here is yeah. amazing. So I had that experience with Shuba Das, who's directing our production, The Importance of Being Earnest. Yes. And Shuba's someone that I've known for I'm about like 10 years or so. I've known him for a good, a good few years. And... When I knew, I, you know, I was told you can appoint whichever freelance director you want to this role. And it was amazing to be able to phone him <laughs> up and go, please, will you come and do a show here? And, you know, he was really excited about it. And, you know, now he's in the building uh, rehearsing it. So there's that. And then also sort of at the other end of the scale, when I knew that we wanted to do a big family Christmas show, being able to call up two writers who I'd worked with a lot and who are brilliant, Susanna Pierce and Kate Ferguson, and say please will you come and write a show for us like that's that those are the things you don't get as a freelance director yeah, which yeah. are just it's amazing to have that um ability to plan further ahead as well and to think okay great what are the sort of shows we, we might want to produce here in a year's time or two years time or what are the sort of writers you know there's an amazing it's such a vibrant scene here in Bolton and Greater Manchester and there's so many talented 
you know, young artists coming through and young writers and to think about, oh, this young writer, what if we commission them now and then maybe two years down the line, we might be able to put on a full show of theirs. Like, that's the sort of thing that is much less in your control as a freelancer. So, yeah, I'm loving that. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And you can think in seasons as well, not in individual productions. So you can put together a package of things that you might work together. Yeah, exactly. And I've loved that. And, uh, yeah, we announced my the first uh, season, the autumn season, last night. And I love that jigsaw of going, okay, great, we're going to do a sort of classic popular play that you know by Maxine Peake that everyone's going to love and we're also going to do a piece of new writing and we're also going to do a new play by a really exciting young Asian writer and then like the family Christmas show yeah putting together that jigsaw so that there's really something for everyone is great that's yeah, yeah I've really loved that process well, what do you think it was what was your pitch in your interview that uh, what was it that got you the job do you think <laughs> I think um I think one of the really key things was having had that year as Associate Artistic Director at Scarborough, because it meant that I, even though I hadn't been an Artistic Director before, I knew the, absolutely like the ins and outs of what that role involved. Yeah. So I think that really made a big difference. And just the fact that, you know, there are sort of interesting similarities between the two buildings. The fact that in Scarborough, you know, I'd really made a commitment to that town and that community and that I could bring those skills over here. The theatre at Scarborough is predominantly in the round, but also has some flexibility and a studio space, which is a similar setup to here. SJT has a relationship with their local university, and obviously the, we've got a great relationship with local university here at the Oxygen. Yeah. So there were sort of interesting parallels with it. So I think that, yeah, had made a big difference. And yeah, then I talked about a lot of ideas of exciting things that I think we could do in the future. So hopefully they were excited by that. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the venues for this new season mm. are quite interesting. Most of them are just across the road from, yeah. from the Octagon, which is now just um, a building site yeah. at the moment. <laughs> but uh, I was surprised when I went in, that was where I first met you, wasn't it, yeah. a few weeks ago, when uh, I saw a production there that, uh, that David Thacker, previous yeah. artistic director, did. And it's a lovely little space, isn't it, that you've got in Bolton Library? Yeah, it's um, yeah. We're really lucky to have found that space. So the Bolton Library and Museum, they are you know regular partners of us anyway, yeah, and yeah. they're they're an incredible organisation. And you know, I've loved spending time there. In fact, as preparation for my interview, I spent a lot of time there and went around the museum and found out a lot about the history of Bolton. And they've got things like their amazing um, Egyptian exhibition. And yeah. so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of buzz. There's a lot of um, people passing through that building every day and something really exciting to me about the fact that you know we the octagon we try and be as welcoming a theatre as we can but there are certain people you know in the town who maybe wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable coming into a theatre building because they might feel like it's not for them or that it's a bit um, intimidating and we're really trying to break down those barriers and go no this is for the people of Bolton this is for everyone but there's something I love the fact that people who will go into the library either to you know get a book or visit the exhibition or go to the aquarium or whatever it's great for us to be producing work this autumn in that space so and saying look we're this is uh, hopefully as easy for you to come and see an Oxygen show as it is for you to pass through the doors of the library and yeah, you know go yeah. and borrow a book so yeah there's a really intriguing theatre space in that building which um yeah, a lot of people don't actually know about it. It's kind of in the basement. Well, it's... I didn't know about it. <laughs> it's on the way to the aquarium, yeah. if you're passing down that way. Uh, and it's a about 170 seat. It's a sort of a lecture theatre, but it has a yeah. lot more character than that. <laughs> so does, when yeah. I think of lecture theatres, I went to a university, you wouldn't <laughs> necessarily want to put a show on in there. But this has a lot of character to it. It has audience kind of curving around the stage, basically. And it's like a mini Greek theatre, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, um, and it's very intimate and sort of interesting to look at. And um, yeah, that, as you say, that's where my colleague David Thacker directed an Arthur Miller play this spring. And um, yeah, it's felt like a really good fit for us because it has, although it's much smaller than the Octagon's main auditorium, it has that sort of intimacy and feel to it. So that seemed like a great fit for the autumn. And we are going to be doing three productions in that space this autumn. So you know, as you say, it's literally, I can, if I look out my office window, I can see it. Um, So it's just a stone's throw away. And that, yeah, is where we're going to be producing Beryl by Maxine Peake, Seagulls by Beth Highland, and I Want to Be Yours by Zia Ahmed. 
Okay, well, let's, let's have a look at the, yeah. the season then. <laughs> Beryl is one, he was, uh, it's been done on the radio, mm-hmm. it's, it has been done on a, in a few theatres, and has, on yeah. a short tour, I think, I mm. haven't seen it. Yeah. But what made you choose that? Does it fit the space better? Because it's a, it's a great atmosphere, but it's a tiny stage, isn't it, even compared to the Oxygen stage, so I suppose you have to measure things to what's going what's to fit in there. Yeah, I mean, I was actually... I know what you mean. As an audience member, the stage does look quite small, but you can get a surprising amount on there. Yes. <laughs> and um, Beryl is a brilliant play by Maxine Peake, who obviously, you know, is an incredible, like, Northwest artist. And she actually started as a member of the Oscar New Theatre, so she's always had this connection with our organisation. And I'd read the play, but I'd never seen it. And it's a play she wrote um, a few years ago, as you say, originally as a radio uh, drama, and then she adapted it for the stage. And it's about this amazing sporting heroine called Beryl Burton, who was this cycling champion in the 1960s. And she was from Leeds. And she was just this incredible, basically like a sporting legend, but a relatively unsung hero, but just had the most incredible career and really dynamic life story. And she was told when she was 11 that she she had some sort of health problems when she was 11 and was told that she wouldn't ever really achieve anything and that she shouldn't do any strenuous exercise. And she became this, you know, immense, you know, sporting talent. And uh, Maxine's done just a beautiful job with the play. Um, it has a cast of four. So, yeah, that felt like a good fit for the yeah. for the library theatre. And um, it's really energetic, fast-paced. There are going to be bikes. Um, it's very funny. But really moving as well and just like a real celebration of this great Northern champion, basically. Yeah. So I was really attracted to it because of that. It's such a great story. Maxine's got such a strong writing voice. And that is going to be directed by a hugely talented director who I've known for a couple of years called Kim Sykes, who actually started, well, early on in her career, she worked here at the Octagon as an assistant director mm-hmm. uh, nearly 10 years ago. And since then, she's... Um, gone from strength to strength and now she's a regular director at the Royal Shakespeare Company she's she's just done a big main stage production of As You Like It for them which is about to go to the Barbican so she's this hugely talented you know young northern director and uh, yeah it seemed like that was a great fit for her so mm. yeah that was what drew me to Beryl it's just a just brilliant story and, and great Maxine, characters. she still has strong links with, with the region she's yeah. still, well, she still lives in the region yeah absolutely fact, when I was at the uh, the library theatre in February, yeah. I was sat next to her. She, yeah. she was actually in the audience. Yeah, exactly. She, you know, has always been a real champion of ours, and um, so yeah, I'm delighted that we're going to be producing one of her plays. Yeah, and after that, I was intrigued to see it was a a modern musical based on Chekhov's The Seagull. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> and a gig theatre as well. Yes, mid, with Middle Child. Yeah, absolutely. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about this. So this is um, a show called Seagulls by a young writer called Beth Highland. And it's a script that I came across a couple of years ago. I'd heard about it, that there was this show that Beth had written that was, it's new writing, it's a new musical, and it's about a band, a university band, for students who, who form a band and then their lives kind of change in extraordinary ways. And um, Beth is actually an American writer. So she'd written a draft of this play and set it in America. And I was put in touch with her and we got on really well and I was talking to her about whether I could try and put together a UK version of the show. And I asked her if it would be okay to... It's a very universal story, but I said, how would you feel about it being relocated to the UK? And she went, yeah, that would be absolutely great. So when I got the job here, I said, oh, how? what about if we put the show on but we set it in Bolton, yeah. at the University of Bolton, which is... And, university are going to be our partners on the production so that all worked out really perfectly but yeah it is it is loosely inspired by the seagull which i know sounds like slightly unlikely as for a you know new musical piece of gig theater but basically she's taken the theme the sort of core themes of the seagull so you know love and anguish and what does it mean to be an artist and generational you know conflict between children and their parents that sort of thing And just distilled it in this amazing way down into these four characters who form a band and with all of the tensions and, you know, that that involves. And, I mean, I think she's really incredible because when I read it, I've got to say, sometimes I've seen Chekhov plays and found them quite hard work. Um, And I know that's sort of an 
you know, people sometimes feel bad about admitting that, but and maybe I just haven't seen great translations, but I feel like I've seen a lot of Chekhov over the years and it hasn't really resonated with me particularly. And I'm sure there are brilliant productions out there, but I feel like the things that I've seen, I found it hard to connect with the characters. I found it hard to, I suppose, understand the stakes of the environment that they're in, in Russia and what the politics are and what are the barriers that prevent them from going to Moscow and that sort of thing. <laughs> it's sort of, I've, I've not, it's not really connected with me personally, like as an audience member. But when I read Beth's version of Seagulls, I really understood, because she said it in a 21st century university town and with the specific politics of a, a band and how, you know, frictions between like the lead singer and the drummer and the keyboard player and that sort of thing. I really understand like the rules of that world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very accessible in that way. And it just means that the themes of the play really sing out and um, will literally sing out in yeah. this music all the way through. But yeah, it's a really smart adaptation. And I feel like you could definitely go and see the play, go and see the show, not knowing anything about Chekhov or the seagull and you'd still have like an absolutely brilliant time and you'd see it as you'd take it on absolute face value of what it is which is a great night out looking at a university band but equally if you are the sort of person who loves Chekhov and maybe has a familiarity with his work you'll see you'll get like some enjoyment out of seeing those themes like yeah. reframed kind of in a different context yeah. so yeah and then I love the idea since they are a band who play all the way through the show and whose songs you know, sort of punctuate the scenes. I'm just really interested in this idea of gig theatre, this kind of re relatively recent phenomenon where, you know, a, lo a lot of companies are looking at blurring those boundaries of live theatre and gigs and live music and what is a great night out experience. And for me, the real experts in that are this company called Middle Child, who are based in Hull, and they've been creating just fantastic, innovative work for, I think, going about seven or eight years. And they've taken stuff to Edinburgh and they've taken stuff down to London and sort of and toured work. They've just done a show that it was a, at Liverpool, Everyman, but also up in Hull. And so I, and I know some of that team and so got in touch with them and said, I want Seagulls to really have that gig theatre feel. How would you guys feel about coming on board and supporting the production and us producing in association with you? And they were great and they said, yeah, we'd love to do that. It sounds right up our street. They read the script and really positive about it and uh yeah so it's been a brilliant i'm really excited about that collaboration yeah. and we've actually just done two days of research and development on the script with two of their team paul smith and james frewer and just the ideas that are coming out in the room are so exciting and they've got a real remit around you know in their work in hull and when they take it elsewhere they're thinking you know, it's a slightly different audience. It's a, you know, maybe a younger audience, an audience who maybe don't feel so much that, for whatever reason, theatre doesn't really speak to them. And one of their priorities is around showing people that, just demonstrating what a great time you can have at live theatre and when you've got brilliant musicians as well. So, yeah, they're, I'm so pleased that we're partnering with them. And I see that as a real... I hope that's something we're going to just continue doing at the Octagon. Like, there's incredible companies out there small scale mid scale large scale who i'd love to partner with and you know have them bring their skills to the organization and have us host them and work with them so yeah really it's nice about seagulls Something else you now have the power to do yeah exactly <laughs> exactly i'm not sure what check would have thought about gig theater but he, he certainly got upset about the early production of the first production of three sisters he thought he'd written a comedy and everybody else was in tears well exactly <laughs> you know i think and often people say that that when you see that if you if you're a russian audience and you see it in the original russian it's this very vibrant experience and there's it's very funny but you, it's also incredibly moving and yeah. that element i feel i haven't particularly seen in some of the Chekhov that i've seen so but i feel like people will experience yeah. that with this the stiff upper lipped yeah. english aristocracy and not the same as the yeah exactly emotional uh, russian aristocracy though. exactly so hopefully this will yeah bring some of that atmosphere yeah the emotion I, of it i hope so i hope so uh, and then the third one in the season mm. is uh, a new piece isn't it yeah so we're um as i said i'm really excited about the idea of collaborating more with other companies and there are two two of the companies that I really admire one is called Tamasha who've been developing 
fantastic work with diverse artists for a number of years and they famously first developed East is East yeah. which the Octagon produced in the last couple of years and was a huge hit for us and they're really um, interested in developing you know the next generation of writers and they are co-producing a show with Payne's Plough who are another company you know who specialise in new writing they've been around for about 40 years so they have co-produced a play called I Wanna Be Yours which is by a young writer called Zia Ahmed and that has done a, I believe that was in Edinburgh and did a sort of small tour and then they wanted to take it out on tour again and I just thought it would be perfect for our audiences um, he's such a talented writer and he comes from a sort of poetry spoken word background and it's a, it's a love story really about this young couple called Ella and Hasib and the play follows them kind of navigating romance and the North-South Divide and other culture clashes. And it's directed by um, this brilliant emerging director called Anna Himali Howard. So, yeah, I just got on the phone with Payne's Plow and with Tamasha and said, you know, we, I would love for us to receive that. I'd love for Bolton audiences to see it. So, yeah, that's going to be coming to us in November. Right. Yeah. And then for these after these small-scale ones, you've announced the Christmas show. Yes. Which is rather large. You, you, said, <laughs> you said you've managed to... Uh, find a couple of writers you wanted to work with yeah. and give them a job. And yeah. it's going to be at the football ground, which is a bit of a trek from here, but it, well, they've used it the last couple of years for their Christmas show. Yeah, so um, last Christmas, the Octagon produced a production of Wonderful Wizard of Oz at the yeah. stadium. And when it was first mentioned to me, I sort of had visions of the show being on the football pitch itself. It's not <laughs> on the football pitch itself. Um, if overlooking you, the football pitch. Overlooking yeah. the football pitch. There's a big, just a massive room down at the stadium, which is a sort of, just this, this big room that people can hire out for events and that sort of thing. Um, this kind of aircraft hangar, huge space. So we're going to hire out that room, build a stage install 800 seats and that's where yeah our festive show is going to be so that's where Wizard of Oz was and um, yeah we're going to be back there this festive season uh, with a brand new production of Treasure Island which I was amazed to find the Octagon has not done even though you know in 50 years because it's such a staple of you know regional theatre Christmas titles but we'd never done it and so that seemed like you know the perfect opportunity to do it you know it's a story that people are familiar with but um, yeah our audiences hadn't really seen it on stage and yeah, as I said, Sue Pierce and Kate Ferguson have brought on board to adapt it. So it'll be a really fun family musical with songs, um, actor musicians in the cast, but also a young company, probably two teams of young people who are going to be on stage as well. And uh, that's going to be directed by a director called Tim Jackson, who, again, I've worked with over the years because he also he's one of those people who's like sickeningly talented he is a director he is also a choreographer and a musical director so I've worked with him in his choreography and musical directing capacities before and um, a couple of years ago he did if you saw the uh, Little Shop of Horrors at the Royal Exchange he choreographed and musically directed that Uh, so he's just he's one of those like one in a kind amazing people and he's worked a lot on big scales so he stages the Olivia Awards for example so he's used to working in big spaces so yeah when I knew that we would be at the stadium I thought he's the perfect person to come and just marshal marshal the troops (laughs) yeah Yeah. the last few years the Octagon's been uh, announcing a season of a full 12 months at a time but this this is a fairly short season but I suppose you new in the post and you've got a new building coming up so uh, I suppose you want to put a limit on how much you announce in one go yeah it seemed yeah we talked a lot about this and it seemed to make sense that um, the festive show Treasure Island which will finish at the end of December because we will then be very much in the like final stages of getting back into the new building we wouldn't actually be producing anything in the spring and the first show that we produce in 2020 will be the opening show in the new right. theatre. So um, that will be in April. So it made sense to announce, you know, the autumn and winter, yeah, and yeah. then we'll do a big new announcement for the 2020 season when we're back in the, in the building. So uh, past the new building, it's, uh, it's hard to see what's going on at the moment from the outside. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is the progress? What's, uh, what's going on at the moment? Well, it's all on track. The uh, steel is has gone in so stuff is having a lot of stuff has been torn down and now stuff is going back up which is great so um yeah i gather that it's all is on track and uh, but obviously you know it's a big refurbishment so these yeah. things take time but yeah we are 
we should be reopening in April next yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens then in April? How much do you know about what you're going to do from then? So having just announced you know, the season, the autumn season uh, last night, now all of my focus is on, yeah, exactly that, 2020, what show to open the building with, how I want that first season to look, what sort of range of shows, you know, that I want to have. So, yeah, I'm just ha- starting to have conversations with lots of different artists and partners and... Um, other companies about what that first program will be so yeah it's all it's at the early stage of development right now and what's the big dream then for the next few years well when I was interviewed and I was asked about my vision for the theatre I talked about what I really want what I really see the octagon as producing in the future is work that is popular bold and adventurous so you know, I really believe in putting on work that people want to come and see. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's a really fundamental thing. And, you know, as I said earlier, I, I kind of grew up as an assistant director working on big shows that were, you know, like Matilda, that were are hugely popular in terms of titles, but they're also the highest possible artistic quality. Like, that's really the, the, the dream. And the audiences here, we're so lucky with them in that they, over the last 50 years, there's been such a range of work yeah. at the octagon and right. it's been you know everything from shakespeare to arthur miller to new writing to musicals so there's a real appetite for a broad range of work and um you know that's what i want to carry on doing but equally i really want the work on stage to reflect the town in the broadest possible sense so that people within the town sort of see themselves being reflected on stage so that's a priority for me so i feel like that's sort of encompassed in that popular bold and adventurous idea but I'm also really inspired by the fact that so many shows started their life here at the Octagon some of which have gone on to be performed around the world so plays like Two by Jim Cartwright and Martha Josie and the Chinese Elvis by Charlotte Jones you know there's a really strong new writing current running through the theatre and I think that's incredibly exciting so I'd love to do more world premieres and um, yeah just sort of get, get a good sort of healthy variety basically so yeah classics new writing musicals yeah popular bold and adventurous <laughs> <laughs> that was lottie wakeham the new artistic director of the octagon theater in bolton the new season starts with beryl on the 19th of september 2019 continuing with seagulls starting on the 24th of october and i want to be yours from the 11th of november all at bolton's library theater and then the Christmas production of Treasure Island will run from the 8th of December in the premier suite of the University of Bolton Stadium. The newly refurbished theatre is scheduled to reopen in spring 2020. For more information, see octagonbolton.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.